Throughout March, we're celebrating Women's History Month by spotlighting women who are breaking the glass ceiling. And today, we're honoring those at the forefront of the fight for gender equality. Take a look. Since 1923, American women have been rallying in support of an official equal rights amendment that guarantees women the same legal rights as men. And in a groundbreaking vote, Congress passed the ERA in 1972, but missed the deadline for state ratification. But thanks to the leadership of Congresswoman Jackie Speer, Senator Lisa Murkowski, ERA Coalition President Carol Jenkins, and America's first female Vice President Kamala Harris, there is a new push to make the Equal Rights Amendment the law of the land. Simply put, there can be no expiration date on equality. Good afternoon, I'm Jennifer Rabb, and I have the great privilege of serving as the president of Hunter College in New York City, where online or on campus, the American dream continues to come true. It is an honor to welcome faculty, government officials, and especially students from campuses all across the country to our fifth annual Campus ERA Day. From the video we just viewed together, it's clear how far we have come in the past five years and how close we are at last to ERA now and full constitutional equality for women. Today's event is yet another demonstration of history making commitment from you, our students. What makes this gathering even more impressive is that after more than a year of social isolation, lockdown and remote learning, so many of you still have the fire and the energy to maintain the fight for social justice and equal rights, even if we are still compelled to rally by Zoom. But then again, Campus ERA Day pioneered the art of online gatherings. For you, we're already linking colleges across the country long before the rest of us learned the art and science of Zoom. It reminds us that if we stay connected, there is no end to what we can achieve. Once again, my thanks go to the ERA Coalition and its sister organization, the Foundation for Women's Equality, and their extraordinary leader, Carol Jenkins, who will be on screen shortly. Thank you, Carol, for being such a great friend to Hunter College. And of course, to the Human Rights Program here at Hunter College and its own inspiring Rita Hauser director, Jessica Newworth, for bringing so many students together today to continue the battle for ERA ratification. You may know that here at Hunter, we have a historic commitment to human rights for women. A century and a half ago, Hunter became one of the first women's colleges in America and a first place where black students and white students, Christians and Jews were invited from the very start to sit together, learn together and achieve great things together. Here at Hunter, we are also inspired by our surroundings. Our human rights program operates from the landmark Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute and it was once the home of the first lady of the nation and the world, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the 20th century's greatest champions of women's rights, civil rights, and human rights. True, Eleanor came rather late to support an equal rights amendment, but she had long advanced the core principle of women's equality in her newspaper articles, her radio shows, and her relentless progressive activism as the conscious of the New Deal. As the legendary New York Congresswoman Bella Abzug once said, Eleanor was an instinctive feminist. Most of her work was for the advancement of women in peace and in politics. And Bella would know. 80 years ago, when she was a Hunter senior and class president, she shared a Hunter College stage with Mrs. Roosevelt, and they both wore hats. 
perhaps one of the students participating in today's event might go on to someday to be in Congress herself, just like our Bella. In fact, we expect nothing less. Bella went on to advocate for the original ERA resolution in the House of Representatives, and she did so in her freshman year when newcomers were supposed to be quiet and keep their opinions to themselves. More recently, it was here at Roosevelt House that another New York Congressman, Jerry Nadler, soon after becoming chair of the House Judiciary Committee, publicly announced new Capitol Hill hearings on the ERA, the first in 35 years. Maybe it's no coincidence that Jerry holds the congressional seat that Bella Abzug herself occupied in the 1970s. Today, we are deeply honored that some of our most influential public figures and government leaders will be joining us today for Campus ERA Day. We are thrilled to welcome back to Roosevelt House, our hunter neighbor, the incomparable activist, Gloria Steinem, together with yet another neighbor, our own brilliant representative in Congress, Carolyn Maloney, chair of the House Oversight Committee and longtime and powerful advocate for the ERA, and also, of course, for Hunter College. And we are truly honored to welcome back to campus, virtually another relentless equal rights champion, the veteran US Senator from Illinois, who serves as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the majority whip. Welcome and great thanks to Senator Dick Durbin. We are truly honored to welcome a first time guest at Roosevelt House, Senator Susan Collins of the state of Maine. We have been reading a great deal over the past year about the hopeless political divide that handcuffs the US Senate and makes bipartisan progress so difficult. But no matter which party is in control, Susan Collins has never for a moment backed off her consistent support for the ERA and in an evenly divided Senate, her voice and her vote remain crucial and continue to make her a major force in this battle. Senator Collins, thank you for showing there is no aisle wide enough to keep women apart in the quest for equality. And how amazing it is to welcome back to Hunter, New York's own, none other than our senior U.S. Senator and the majority leader of the United States Senate, CUNY's great friend, Chuck Schumer. Senator, you have always fought for higher education, and for that, we are truly grateful. And your extraordinary leadership skills have put us all back on the path to American recovery. You have shown again and again how much you also care about equal rights and human rights. It's an honor to have you with us today, as always. We will be welcoming additional guests and a few surprises too. Among them, Heidi Schreck, whose Tony-nominated play, What the Constitution Means to Me, has helped all of us understand why the ERA is so imperative to fulfilling the original American promise of opportunity for all. Before I introduce our first speaker, I want to reiterate my gratitude to two very special leaders. Jessica Newworth, who serves as the Rita Hauser Director of the Roosevelt House Human Rights Program. And thank you, Roosevelt House Board Chair Rita Hauser for your generous support and great leadership always. And our Carol Jenkins, the iconic TV news anchor and documentary filmmaker who heads up the ERA coalition. Together, Carol and Jessica are leading the good fight and bringing students into a battle that will surely shape their futures as well as ours. You're both truly inspiring women. And now I'm delighted to introduce the students who put today's program together. All of them are fellows in the Grove program at Roosevelt House. 
named for an extraordinary Hunter alumna, Eva Casting Grove, whom we thank together with the Grove family for endowing this program. All of these Grove fellows are lucky enough to be working this semester in a cohort led by Carol and Jessica with a goal of producing this complex event. They are Zainab Ahmad, Sara Makwan, Trina Sultan, and Priyan Singh. Thank you all for caring about the future. We are so proud of these students and what you have done today and in the future. Enjoy the program. And now it is a great pleasure to bring Priya to the screen. Thank you, President Rab. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual Campus ERA Day. My name is Priya Singh, and I am one of the Grove Fellows this year. I'm also a junior studying human biology in the Macaulay Honors College at Hunter College. The Grove Fellows and I, as well as our cohort leaders, Jessica Newworth, Carol Jenkins, Yin Lama, and Katrina Avia, work together on Campus ERA Day this year to spread awareness about the Equal Rights Amendment and to emphasize how important it is to remove its time limit so it can finally find its way into the Constitution. The ERA would guarantee equal rights for all, regardless of sex. I'd also like to thank our wonderful partners who have worked closely with us in organizing and promoting Campus ERA Day, including the ERA Coalition, Feminist Front, It's On Us, and Generation Ratify. In addition, we have representatives from 52 campuses across 26 states here with us tonight. I want to welcome Decatur High School in Georgia. From Maryland, we have Poolsville High School, University of Maryland at College Park, and Walter Johnson High School. We also have the University of Southern Mississippi. And from North Carolina, we have Appalachian State, East Carolina University, UNC Chapel Hill, and UNC Wilmington. Thank you all for being here and supporting this critical cause. We look forward to having a fulfilling and engaging discussion tonight with our wonderful students and guest speakers. I will now pass it over to my colleague, Trina Sultan. Hi, thank you Priya for the introduction. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Trina Sultan. I'm also one of the Grove Fellows this year. I'm currently a junior in Hunter College, double majoring in political science and media studies. Leading up to Campus ERA Day, we've been raising awareness about the ERA through our social media platforms, urging students to take virtual action for equality. On our Twitter and Instagram, at Campus ERA Day, we've been creating a social media presence with the goal to educate as many students as possible about the amendment and get them involved in the movement. Every 92 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. The ERA would give these survivors more access to justice. So a week before the event, we started a social media campaign to virtually mobilize students, asking them to take 92 seconds to call their senator to vote yes on the ERA. In an effort to further mobilize campuses virtually, we also held a digital day of action. With digital actions such as continuing our hashtag Campus ERA Day call-ins and a social media storm where we asked students to post a picture with a caption about why they support the ERA and why we need our lawmakers to prioritize the ERA now. We'd like to take the time to thank everyone involved in our social media campaign as we were able to reach over 500 users across all social media platforms and make a definite impact in this fight for equality. We'd also like to thank some of the other campuses here with us tonight. From Illinois, we have University of Chicago, Northern Illinois University, Northern Pritzker School of Law, and University of Illinois at Chicago. We also have Manhattan High School in Kansas, Purdue University in Indiana, Carleton College in Minnesota, Southern New Hampshire University, University of Iowa, University of Michigan, and Montana State University. From Ohio, we have Kent State University and University of Toledo. And lastly, from Texas, we have Michael E. Bakey High School for Health Professionals, University of Texas at Austin, and University of Houston. Thank you all for being here with us today. I will now hand it over to my colleague, Zainab Bahamid. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Zainab Ahmad. I'm a junior in the Macaulay Honors Program at Hunter College. I'm in the Bachelor of Social Work Program with the Silberman School of Social Work, and I'm completing a certificate in public policy with the Roosevelt House, and I'm also one of the Grove Fellows. We're excited to have you all here and have more campuses joining us tonight, including the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And from California, we have California State University from Long Beach, Magnolia High School, Orange Coast College, UC Berkeley, in UC San Diego. And from South Carolina, we have Coastal Carolina University and College of Charleston. From Florida, we have Eckerd College. From Virginia, we have Me Mechanicsville High School and University of Mary Washington. And in Washington, uh, DC, we have Georgetown University. 
Thank you for your support and participation. And I will now hand it over to Sarah Mecklon. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah. I'm a sophomore at Hunter studying political science and women and gender studies. I've been working with my other Grove Fellows and our cohort leaders to help put together the fifth and hopefully final campus ERA day. I'm excited to be here and I'd like to welcome our last batch of campuses joining us tonight. From Massachusetts, we have Fitchburg State University, Smith College, University of Massachusetts Amherst and Wheaton College. From Maine, Thomas College and University of Maine School of Law. From New York, we have Fayetteville Manlius High School, Hunter College, Marist College, New York University and St. John's University. From Connecticut, Yale University, from Vermont, Middlebury College, and from Pennsylvania, we have University of Pennsylvania and East Stroudsburg University. Thank you all again to all the campuses who have joined us for Campus ERA Day. Tonight, our moderator is Carol Jenkins, who is president and CEO of the ERA Coalition and the Fund for Women's Equality, sister organizations dedicated to the passage and enactment of the Equal Rights Amendment and co-founded by Jessica Newworth, the director of the Human Rights Program at Roosevelt House Hunter College. Carol Jenkins, an award-winning journalist and founding president of the Women's Media Center, has been with the ERA Coalition since it was founded in 2014, and she has been with us every year to moderate Campus ERA Day. Please welcome Carol Jenkins. Sarah, thank you so, so much. It is such a pleasure to be back again this year. And uh, may we compliment these Grove Fellows for such an extraordinary uh, achievement this year. So many campuses in so many states, you've done really, really well. Uh, thanks to President Rabb, to Harold Holzer, who's the director of Roosevelt House, to the Grove family uh, for the fellowship program. I am so pleased to lead this ERA cohort this year with Jessica Newworth and Katrina Avila, the ERA Coalition and Fund for Women's Equality. Um, we have over 200 partners and supporting or organizations working across the country for the Equal Rights Amendment. And one of the highlights of our year is partnering on Campus ERA Day. At this point, I'd like to introduce the co-chairs of the coalition and the fund, Kimberly Peeler Allen and Mona Sinha. Kimberly, we'll start with you. Thank you so much, Carol. It is so wonderful to be here with all of you and to see so many students from across the country who are rallying to make sure that lived equality is actually something that is achievable in this country. Uh, I heard one of the Grove fellows say that this will hopefully be the final uh, campus ERA day, and I'm aspirational that this will not be the final campus ERA day, that we will come back next year on the anniversary of the codification of the Equal Rights Amendment as a true celebration and a true exhibit of all that we have done together. So thank you all so much for being here this evening for, I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation, and thank you for being with us in this work. Kimberly, thank you so much, so much. It is now my pleasure to introduce Heidi Schreck, a writer and actress from Wenatchee, Washington. She wrote, created, and performed uh, in her play, What the Constitution Means to Me, which was a finalist for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize for Drama and was nominated for a Tony Award for Best Play and also for Best Acting. Her play has been instrumental in moving the Equal Rights Amendment forward. It was cited several times at the congressional hearing on the ERA, and we are very proud to have Heidi as a member of the Board of Directors of the ERA Coalition and Fund for Women's Equality. Jessica Lenahan is an activist who speaks up for political justice, a very good friend of the coalition. Uh, we respect her work so much. Her three daughters, uh, you may know the story, were killed after police failed to enforce a restraining order against her estranged husband. Uh, he had abducted their children. She now uses her voice to advocate and speak up 
for the importance of women's rights and political activism. And she has been a powerful spokesperson for the Equal Rights Amendment. We thank her so much for her continued uh, efforts in, in this regard. Well, the connection is that Heidi wrote about Jessica Lenahan's case, which went all the way to the Supreme Court where it was dismissed. And her quest for justice continued to the Inter-American Commission Commission of Human Rights, which recognized her claim of gender-based discrimination in the failure of law enforcement to protect her children. Heidi's play features Jessica's case, which so tragically illustrates the need for the ERA. Please welcome Heidi Schreck and Jessica Lenahan. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here and particularly an honor to get to speak with one of my heroes, Jessica Lenahan, again. Uh, I also want to say I'm from Wenatchee, but I'm calling in from Brooklyn. Um, I'm, I'm on the uh, traditional and unceded land of the Lenape people. Um, I'm very happy to be talking to Jessica today. Um, I, I learned about Jessica's story while researching my play. I wrote a play about the constitution that dealt with generations of domestic violence in my own family. And when I was searching to discover why the law hadn't protected my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, I learned about Jessica's story and the fact that the law had not protected her or her three daughters. Uh, I also learned about the court case, Gonzalez versus Castle Rock, which, um, which basically stated that there was no legal obligation for the police to protect Jessica or her daughters. Uh, this case was devastating. Uh, it was a devastating reminder that our constitution and our federal laws do not protect anyone and particularly women from domestic violence. Um, and I became very inspired when I learned that Jessica had subsequently devoted her life to fighting for uh, the rights of women, for the rights of um, survivors, that she had taken her case all the way to the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, and that she has continued her advocacy um, on behalf of indigenous rights. So I, I just want to say that Jessica's case is a clear, sign of why we need an equal rights amendment. We need our greatest document, our federal laws to say that people and women in particular deserve to be protected from assault and violence. Um, I want to open this up to Jessica because I'm such a huge admirer of hers and just ask her uh, about her advocacy work right now, and also in particular, because we've had a conversation recently, ask her why she might be feeling uh, more hopeful in this moment than she has in the past. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Bunch of beautiful faces. Thank you for joining me and allowing me to be part of the forum. Um, I think what's really important is that we're looking at the ERA and the tremendous strides and the sacrifices that such resilient women have brought to the table. Um, and there's so many counterparts that are sitting right here uh, giving this talk today. So if we can just tie in a little bit where the ERA, uh, the constitution, human rights, indigenous rights, women's rights as a whole are playing a part in how we proceed with this huge step forward um, in the 28th Amendment and changing our constitution for the very first time. Um, we are looking at actual equality and quality of life and what that means. But I don't think that our mission stops there. I don't think we could hang up our combat boots and say that we could see the forest through the trees at this point. I think it's still going to be an uphill battle and knowing that uh, there are so many instrumental players in this chess game that we're in, um, we still have to be vigilant. We still have to keep the momentum going in how we press forward, how we impress on our next generations and how they foresee gender biases being removed in how we, we later treat one another as human beings. And although, no, 
the United States is the only country in the United States, it, well, in the whole world that has not embraced human rights, sadly. But where we need rights written in our constitution for equality, human rights is a given. We are human beings. And I think we just need to start claiming that along with equal rights um, for women and indigenous rights. Jessica, it's all inclusive. Can I ask you, because I know you've done tremendous advocacy <laughs> um, uh, to fight for indigenous rights and I imagine the Supreme Court will see you again one day uh, <laughs> to fight for that. Can I ask you about the intersection of the Equal Rights Amendment um, and indigenous rights? Because I know that um, indigenous women in particular suffer the most violence in this country. And I wonder if you could talk for just a moment about how you see the Equal Rights Amendment making life better for indigenous women in particular. Absolutely, thank you for that question. Um, I am of Pueblo Indian bloodlines, a descendant of uh, the Pueblo Indians from Mesa Verde in New Mexico. And we migrated toward Colorado after the Spaniards so many years ago sort of uh, intercepted our land and, and the, the way we cultivated our lives around different parts of how we migrated from one site to the other, depending on the season. And we followed the buffalo so often, but I think indigenous rights, we look at how so many other sectors of women that go missing or abused or violated against are very vocal in the exposure of our news and how our government perceives that. We're Native Americans, I think, between US law and tribal law gets crossed because nor the US law nor tribal law has any jurisdiction over how women go missing are violated, are abused, are, I mean, we can go on down the line down to where our children are still being taken, um, fostered out and oftentimes adopted without the parents' knowledge, all because we don't have electricity or water for lack of pipelines. And as you know, if you watch, pipelines are one of our biggest issues, but it gives the federal government grounds to remove our children for not having their basic needs being met. Where most people would be protected and their children would be protected under those uh, clauses in the United States that just don't exist for indigenous peoples. Right. Thank you. I, I know this is a huge, uh, th this is the work that you're doing right now. And I just want to thank you for talking about it. And also just to bring up again, that I feel like this is an intersectional issue and that if we can get this amendment passed, it's going to benefit um, women of all communities, that we know that these oppressions are linked and that if we can finally get women to be part of the constitution, we can address problems in a lot of our communities, including the indigenous community. I think that it has to start becoming part of our language, just as so much as um, any other language that arises within the possibility of being protected um, and how we perceive that going forward, especially by our police and how it got to be so uh, much of a disaster has me confounded. I remember when they used to just carry a badge in a billy club and society respected their authority and how it got to be with the high rate of deaths and murders, uh, oftentimes perpetrated by our own police. Um, it's, it's problematic, but for indigenous peoples, uh, like the Derek Chauvin trial, although I don't wanna focus on that, would never come to light for a woman such as myself as a Native American person. I would, I, I think being um, an indigenous person, I had to make plenty of noise to get recognized. Uh, so it's, it's important that I do the work 
because if I don't do the work, then who is going to pick up that baton and move it forward? Thank you. I know that I am so grateful uh, for the work that you are doing. And also we've talked about this before that we have a real opportunity here, right? We have a window, a moment when we have momentum behind us and we have the ability to actually remove this time limit and get this amendment in our constitution. And I know you have devoted your life to this and so many other people here. And I feel like if we can all pick up the baton right now and spread the word and and all of you amazing young people watching right now can pick it up and help us get it out there. We have a moment in time when we can actually make this happen after so many years. Um, and I, I wanna do that for you. I want us all to do it for you and for all of the people who came before us who have fought so hard for this. So thank you for your work and uh, we owe it to you and so many others to make this happen now. Thank you so much. More so, I want to see it happen for your children. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have two daughters. I have two brand new daughters. I also want to see it happen for them. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I adore you and love you. And I'm so happy to get to talk to you. <laughs> right back at you. What, um, what, a, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you both so much. Jessica Lenahan's case is, a, is a, a tragic and powerful example of why uh, we need the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, thanks to Jessica for being with us today. Uh, she's done so much to help spread the word and mobilize support. Uh, and to uh, our dear friend, Heidi, uh, uh, who uh, whose uh, reputation and fabulous work on Broadway opened and closed uh, the congressional hearing that we had on the Equal Rights Amendment. We are, are so thankful to both of you. You're just tremendous. Uh, last year, although the House passed a bill to remove the time limit on the ERA, that bill died in the Senate because of opposition from Senate leadership. Uh, we now have a new leadership, uh, committee uh, in the Senate, and we are honored to have a message uh, to Campus ERA Day from Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, a senator from our own hometown of New York State. Hi, everyone. This is Senator Chuck Schumer, and I'm really excited to be with you for the fifth annual Campus ERA Day. Thank you to the incredible Grove Fellows at Hunter College who put this event together. As you all know, the Equal Rights Amendment was first introduced 100 years ago. And 100 years later, the need for its passage is clearer and more urgent than ever. And for all the work we've done, we still have a long way to go to achieve a world where women and men truly stand on equal footing in all areas of life. From the pay gap to pregnancy discrimination to the horrendous stories of sexual assault and harassment we've confronted over the last few years and which have existed for far longer in the shadows, it's clear the task is still left unfinished. So we need the Equal Rights Amendment, and I'm gonna work with my colleagues in the Senate to make progress on legislation to remove the deadlines for state ratification. I assign this bill as Senate Joint Resolution 1 because it's so important. It will open new avenues of legal resource to anyone facing discrimination on the basis of sex. It'll make sure the courts apply consistent standards to look at sex discrimination cases as we do the same in racial discrimination. And best of all, it would unleash a new wave of economic opportunity for millions who have been historically held back. Everyone should rally behind this worthy cause. I'm so grateful for all of you for working to raise awareness and create support for the ERA. And I promise I'll stand with you as we work together to build a better, fairer, and more inclusive society where we all can reach our full potential. Thanks so much. And our thanks so much uh, to Senator Schumer. Well, the bill pending in the Senate SJ1, we got one, that's a good side, has bipartisan uh, leadership. Thanks to Senator Lisa Markowski from Alaska, who is the lead Republican co-sponsor of SJ1. And we're pleased to have representation from campuses in Alaska with us tonight. Last week, the ERA Coalition gave Senator Murkowski its first Alice Paul Award. 
in recognition of her leadership on the ERA together with Senator Ben Cardin, the Democratic co-sponsor of SJ1, and representatives Jackie Spear and Carolyn Maloney, who championed the ERA in the House. The ERA was first drafted by Republican suffragist Alice Paul, and here's what Senator Murkowski had to say about Alice Paul and the fight for the ERA. Hello, I'm U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski, and I'm glad to be able to join you for this special event. Courageous women have been pushing for basic equal rights for a century now. These include women like Alice Paul, who understood that excluding women from the rights and responsibilities enshrined in our Constitution was, and still is, a grave error, and that failing to legally acknowledge men and women as equals undermines the liberty of all Americans and the core principles on which our country was founded. As the leader of the National Women's Party, Alice Paul was a major driving force behind ratification of the 19th Amendment. During her campaign for women's suffrage, Alice was imprisoned, force-fed, and treated brutally for her advocacy. And yet she showed strength and dignity in the face of unimaginable circumstances all for the sake of the rights that women enjoy today. It is an honor to receive an award in her name and to work alongside so many of you to help ensure that women's, women's rights are equal rights, explicitly recognized under the Constitution. Together, we have made progress in raising awareness and building support, and I'm optimistic. This is the first Congress to begin with the necessary 38 states having ratified the amendment. SJ Res 1 was the first bipartisan piece of legislation that Senator Cardin and I introduced in the 117th Congress. That's a priority, signaling what a priority it is for both of us. I'd like to give a special thank you to Bettina and Carol at the Equal Rights Coalition for their tireless advocacy and to Senator Cardin for his leadership on this important initiative. And of course, to everyone who has been working the halls of state legislatures and pushing to get local representatives on board, you are truly the reason that we're getting closer and closer to our goal. So thank you again for honoring me with this special award and for all that you are doing in the name of equality. Thank you and take care. And uh, our thanks uh, to Senator Markowski. Uh, Gloria Steinem is a leader in the women's movement who has inspired all of us. She's a veteran of the campaign for the uh, ERA and a veteran of Campus ERA Day as well. Uh, Gloria is unable to join us live tonight, but she did want to be with us. And so we bring you this recent conversation she had with Grove uh, Campus ERA Day fellows, Sarah Makwan, Priya Singh, and Trina Sultan. Hi, Mrs. Steinem. So firstly, I think um, we can all introduce ourselves. So my name is Sarah. I'm one of the Grove Fellows. Um, so yes, we're super excited to talk to you today. Hi, I could continue. My name is Trina, and we're so happy that you're joining us today. And I'm also a Grove Fellow. Hi, Ms. Steinem. Wonderful to meet you. My name is Priya. I'm also one of the Grove Fellows and very excited. Well, I'm excited to see the three of you because you're actually going to see the ERA become part of the Constitution. I can't wait. <laughs> and please call me Gloria. OK, thank you so much for joining us today for the fifth annual Campus ERA Day. We know how busy you are, so we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us to talk about the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. And your commitment towards ending gender-based uh, discrimination is deeply motivating and inspiring to young women like ourselves and my fellows. Um, and the first question I wanted to ask you is, we know you're an activist and a prominent figure who's been in the movement going as far back as the 1970 Senate hearing. So what do you think has caused the current revival of the movement since, as we've seen, the Virginia just became the 30th state to ratify it in 2020? And how do you think today's push for the ERA is different from the movement as it first began? Well, as it first began, we were fighting state by state. And uh, since we have had all the 38 states, then of course the focus becomes on Congress instead. So it is, it is quite different because one of the main adversaries state by state was the insurance industry 
uh, that didn't, it took us a while to figure this out, I have to say, <laughs> that didn't want to equalize their actuarial tables because it would cost them money. So that was part of the reason that there was, um, or much of the reason that there was resistance uh, at the end, and it took us a while to figure that out because the huge majority, 90% of women always favored it, the majority of Americans favored it, and we it took us a while to figure out what the resistance was. Now um, it should be uh, just procedural, I think, and it's very exciting to know that after 50 years we're actually going to put the word women in the Constitution. Every other democracy in the world has that. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, so we also wanted to ask you, you know, since you've been in the movement for so long, you've obviously had to overcome obstacles after obstacles. And so what keeps you motivated to keep fighting, you know, and advocating for women's rights, you know, for your whole life up until now? You do, the three of you. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the reason for a movement is we need each other. Uh, human beings are communal animals. We're not able to function for very long by ourselves. And what uh, makes it uh, strong and continuing and enjoyable is that it forms a community and we get to work together. Um, it's, I think, especially great to, in my experience, to work together across generations because I can be helpful because I remember when it was even worse so I can cheer you up and <laughs> you're helpful to me because you're mad that it's not better right now. <laughs> so together we make a great team. I definitely agree. I feel like even just, you know, meeting Trina, Priya and Zainab, like we, it's kind of inspiring, like, you know, knowing that we're all fighting for the same thing and like being able to meet you and other people in the movement who can, you know, give us advice and kind of like show us, you know, what are the best ways to fight for, you know, the things we want. Mm -hmm. And I especially, you know, since we recently lost the great Ruth Ginsburg, I think uh, the best tribute to her would be to put women in the Constitution. I completely agree. Thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, as someone who supports the ERA and wants to see it in the Constitution, how do you think we as, as students can inspire others, especially the younger generation, to get involved? Mm -hmm. You know, as someone who's been in, involved in this movement for so long, how do you think we can sustain and further mobilize this movement? Mm -hmm. Well, I trust your judgment on that because you're working with your peers and you, you know best. I think one of the ways is to explain that it's not just a principle, that it has an outcome in their individual lives. So, uh, you know, Jessica Newworth has done a, a great job in her book of explaining exactly the difference it would make once it passes in individual cases. Um, and I, I think that, that that's helpful. Yeah, I definitely agree. And we'd like to thank you so much for your time and everything you've done to advance the fight for equal rights. And this conversation was very informative and we appreciate your insight. And we promise that our generation will be the generation to pass the RA and finally get to see women in the Constitution. Oh, we're gonna have such a good time celebrating. Yes. I think we should dance. You know, Emma Goldman always said, if there's no dancing at the revolution, I'm not coming, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, as soon as it passes, let's dance, even, even if it's Zoom dance, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Okay, great to see you all. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. See there, what what a great opportunity, you know, to be able to agree with Gloria Steinem. You know, wonderful interview, <laughs> fellows. You did a great job. I'm glad you agreed with her, though. You know, we would have had trouble if you didn't agree. Uh, we we want to see the next conversation when we do have the ERA, and you all can uh, dance 
you know, dance together. Well, the, the fellows have also had a great campaign going on all day on social media. And uh, students around the country have been calling their senators today to urge them to support the ERA. Let's take a look at some of them. Senator Schumer. Your name, number, comment, or a brief message after the tone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Trina Salton, and I'm calling as a constituent of Senator Schumer to say we need the ERA now. I'm calling today to ask you to co sponsor SJ Res 1 and vote yes when it's introduced into the Senate. The bill would remove the deadline for the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, a U.S. constitutional amendment that would prohibit sex discrimination in the United States. I'm asking you to solve for your constituents who experience gender discrimination. I also urge you to encourage your colleagues to do the same. We will remember who stood with us at this historic moment. This has been a decades-long fight, and we can no longer wait. We are calling on you to be on the right side of history and be with us in this fight. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, that was terrific. Thank you, fellows. Uh, keep up the calls. Everybody out there, keep up the calls. Call for your senators to make sure that, uh, you know, that they are supporting the ERA, that they are supporting all of us. So all it says is that you cannot discriminate based on sex. Uh, we need to get this done this year. Uh, right Right now, I want to uh, introduce uh, Jessica Newworth, uh, who is our leader in all senses of the words. You know, thank you, Jessica, for bringing me into uh, the conversation about the ERA and the work. I've enjoyed it, it, working with you and, and learned so, so much. We are waiting for Senator Dick Durbin, uh, and I understand that there are some technical issues, but but Jessica, if, if you could talk about you know, your, your book, your long experience, your dedication to this, uh, having brought so many of us along in this path for, for these many years. Jessica, can you? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I know that uh, Senator Durbin is on his way and we're very excited to have him with us. I think, you know, we started this work uh, in 2014, and at that time, it just seemed like a pipe dream to many people. In fact, I have to say many people laughed at us uh, when we said we wanted to get the ERA in the constitution. It just seemed like some old thing that was never gonna happen. And let me just take this moment to thank Congresswoman Maloney, who really inspired me and has been working on this forever, literally. So, um, so I think we have seen a lot happen and, um, I guess uh, we're now, it looks like at the end of the road and we're hoping as Carol mentioned, not to have campus ERA day next year because we're gonna have the ERA in the constitution. And it's really because of all of this new, fresh, young energy and so much commitment from so many people who seven or eight years ago, either had never heard of the ERA or just didn't understand why we would need it but I think most of us agree, if not all of us, it's really a no brainer. It's just basic equality, 24 words that guarantee non-discrimination. And so, um, so I think this is, this is really our time. And as uh, Carol mentioned before last year, we came so close, the house passed a bill. I think we mentioned there, I'll, I'll just let you know that the house already passed twice now a bill to remove the deadline or the time limit from 1982. So we couldn't get that to the floor of the Senate, but the important thing to note is if we can get it to the floor, we already know we have enough votes to pass it. So it just has to go through those procedural um, uh, hoops to get to the floor. And we now have support, as you heard from Senator Schumer and the democratic leadership of the Senate, but we still have this requirement of 60 senators. So, it's really a great honor for us to have Senator Durbin with us tonight. I gather he's with he's us here he now. Is. He's uh, from the great state of Illinois, which is represented also here tonight by the University of Chicago, Northern Illinois University, Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and the University of Illinois at Chicago. Senator Durbin was first elected to the Senate in 1996. And since 2005, he's been the Senate Democratic Whip, the second highest position in the Democratic leadership of the Senate. 
and he now also chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee. So we are very keen to get his thoughts on the path forward for the Equal Rights Amendment and the removal of the time limit. Senator Durbin, on behalf of Roosevelt House, Hunter College, and the ERA Coalition, welcome to Campus ERA Day, and thank you very much for being with us this evening. Jessica, thank you very much, and Carol Jenkins, thank you as well for co-hosting this and your kind words, Jessica. I wanna thank the Roosevelt House Policy Institute at Hunter College and the Grove Fellows for organizing the fifth annual ERA Day. It's great to see so many campuses and states represented. I was going to shout, get a shout out to Northern Illinois University and the University of Illinois Chicago, but Jessica has added about five or six campuses to the list and I, beyond my uh, early surveillance. I wanna thank my friend, Harold Holzer. The last time Harold invited me to speak at the Roosevelt House uh, at Hunter College, the topic was the Dream Act, which I introduced 20 years ago. Uh, so it seems like we discuss issues that take some time to achieve, not that they aren't meritorious, but they are certainly labor intensive. We're here to discuss an issue of real basic fair fairness that's long overdue. In the inexplicably long history of the Equal, Equal Rights Amendment, I'm afraid Illinois has a very special and dubious distinction. In 1973, 30 states passed the ERA and the amendment was appeared to be headed toward easy ratification. And then there came a certain person from Alton, Illinois, who rallied uh, many against the amendment. Her name was Phyllis Schlafly. She and her anti-ERA acolytes argued that a constitutional amendment banning, banning gender-based discrimination would destroy American families and diminish the role of American women. Up in the social and moral order in America, usher in all sorts of ruin, and God forbid, people be using the same bathrooms. Well, a lot of people bought it. The ratification drive slowed dramatically. And over the next four years, only four states ratified the amendment. Even Illinois, and I was there at the time, I was parliamentarian of the Illinois State Senate when this is all transpiring. Even Illinois, that looked like a certain yes going into the process, voted no. By 1977, 35 states had passed the amendment, three states short of the 38 needed, and then nothing. No more states in the next 44 years, two generations. Then came that glorious day, January 21st, 2017, and there was a little gathering in Washington. I say that facetiously. It was more than a little gathering. A peaceful pink-handed army took to the streets of Washington and New York and Chicago and cities and towns on every continent in the world and said, enough, no more. Change had been percolating for decades from the transformative work of Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the Me Too movement to name just two of the many catalysts. The Women's March reignited the ERA movement. One month after the march, Nevada passed the ERA. The next year, 2018, Illinois corrected its mistake and voted yes. And in 2020, 100 years after women gained the legal right to vote in every state, Virginia became the 38th state at long last to ratify the ERA. So why are we even talking about it? Because we know we have some distance to travel from where we are. How do we get the ERA across the finish line? I think that organizing and strategizing as you're doing with Campus ERA Day is certainly important. Keep the pressure on. I assure you, President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, Democrats in Congress remain absolutely committed to finishing the fight to make ERA the 28th Amendment to the US Constitution. There are discussions about how to go forward. There are three options. First, the Attorney Generals of Illinois, Virginia, and Nevada could appeal the recent ruling from the Federal District Court judge that the state's ratification, their state's ratification, came in too late. They're currently considering whether to do that. Number two, there's an entity in Washington, obscure to most, known as the Office of Legal Counsel. It is a constitutional referee in the U.S. Department of Justice. It provides constitutional guidance for the Justice Department and the White House. And under the, the administration of a previous president, who I won't 
Grace by naming, the OLC said that the deadline for the ERA was 1982 and state ratifications after that were invalid. Now, the Attorney General of the United States has the authority to withdraw that guidance. The Attorney General, Merrick Garland, for whom I voted and have a great deal of respect, was asked that question during the confirmation hearing. Hey, will, you will you reverse the OLC opinion? Stop. He said he wouldn't answer at that hey, time. Stop. So would someone mute, please? Frankly, Merrick Garland has his hands full with the Department of Justice. We're not sure what he's gonna do, if anything, with the OLC memo. The third action is that Congress could resolve the deadline and ratification standoff. There are two proposals on how we can do it, I think Jessica was alluding to. One is to go back to square one. Under this scenario, Congress would pass the Equal Rights Amendment again and send it back to the states for ratification. By the way, five states actually voted to withdraw their endorsements of the ERA after Phyllis Schlafly started her campaign. Some people argue that if we have to accept the late adopters, we should also have to accept the withdrawals. Others say, and I think precedent supports, the states can't repeal ratification. Starting over again would eliminate any controversy over ratification dates, but there are obviously some procedural questions. The last option, U.S. Senate could follow the lead of the House and repeal the ERA deadline. The Constitution doesn't set time limits on ratification of amendments. Congress never set any time limits, deadlines, until 1918 as part of a deal to put together the votes to pass the 18th Amendment on Prohibition. The most recent amendment to the Constitution, passed in 1992, was actually introduced in 1789, 206 years earlier. The House voted to revoke the ERA deadline on March 17th, mostly party line, but a few Republicans did join the Dems. I've long supported this congressional effort to remove the deadline. We have 52 votes at this moment, 50 Dems and two Republicans, Collins and Murkowski. The problem is it only takes one Senator to start a filibuster. I think Jessica was alluding to this earlier. And it takes 60 Senators, eight more than we currently believe we have, to break a filibuster. That's one reason that bringing people together from many states is important. You can coordinate efforts. If the senators from your state already support removing the deadline, thank them and focus on the senators we need to win over. In January, I became chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm talking with my fellow senators about what comes next. In exploring our options in an evenly divided committee, it's 11 to 11, on this, and on the Senate floor is a challenge. One way or the other, we will move forward. I'll close with one last suggestion. It's really more of a request. Shirley Chisholm, God bless her memory, famously said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. State Representative Juliana Stratton was a newcomer to politics in Illinois. She served her first term in the State House of Representatives when she decided to lead the effort to pass the Equal Rights Amendment in 2018. She was not only successful in passing it in 2018 in Illinois, she became the first African-American Lieutenant Governor of our state, bless her, and she's terrific. America has made progress when it comes to women's participation in government, but we still lag behind other countries. Let's change it. When women get involved in politics, the agenda changes and the outcomes change. We need to continue doing what you're doing. Get involved and help us move this nation forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Durbin. We're so hopeful and it's really wonderful to hear you talk about all of these different paths, which, which strike me as not mutually exclusive. And, and certainly the removal of the time limit could, could, could help so much with, with the other paths as well. And as you mentioned, we have 52, which is more than we need, but we have these the 60 vote requirement. And is, is there any advice you can give us about trying to build a more bipartisan coalition? Because we do have these two senators and it does seem like a new no brainer. And I know you have a lot of experience working across the aisle. Any thoughts you could share with us? Well, there are new women on the Republican side and I, I don't know if there's any potential there. They're pretty conservative by nature. 
But I, I tell you, I wouldn't miss the opportunity to open the conversation with them uh, and see if there's uh, some possibility there uh, of getting their support. Uh, and there's, there's a lot to be said for grassroots effort, helping you along in this regard. Uh, and I've seen a lot of it. You have too. There are a lot of women who are really becoming major forces in the politics of my state. And I think that trend is going to continue in a lot of other states too. Uh, so I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, we have two good ones, Collins and Murkowski. Uh, and they're from unusual state situations, Maine and Alaska. But uh, their courage on this is something that may inspire some others. Yeah, and I don't, uh, I don't, we didn't tell you, we have 52 campuses with us from 26 states that really cover the ideological spectrum. So we are really counting on these students to help us get across the finish line as, as well as your leadership. Thank, thank you so much. Absolutely, and tell the students on my behalf, get involved in political campaigns. Find somebody you believe in, it may just be a woman, and decide that you're gonna help. There's always room for more help in campaigns. And if you're part of it, you uh, have uh, an excellent lobbying position to go to that person once elected and urge them to consider some of your own positions on issues. And this is a very important one. Well, Senator Durbin, thank you so much for your uh, support, for your hard work. Congratulations on uh, your promotion. Uh, shall we say, well-deserved. Uh, and we are reaching out to those Republican and Democratic women senators. That's uh, the coalition's uh, next line of work. So thank you for, uh, for supporting that uh, initiative. Uh, and we're so thrilled that you were here today. Uh, Thanks, Carol. It, Thanks, Jessica. Tremendous. Bye -bye. Well, you know, as, uh, as you've heard tonight, to get through the Senate, we need bipartisan support. Uh, last week, Senator Susan Collins from Maine, uh, represented tonight by the University of Maine Law School and Thomas College, uh, signed on as a co-sponsor of SJ Resolution 1 to remove the time limit. Uh, and we welcome this much needed support from Senator Collins and now have two Republican co-sponsors. We only need eight more. Do not, you know, think that we cannot get there, we are going to try. Uh, under the filibuster rules, we need 60. We're working on it. Um, we already know that we have enough votes once it gets to the floor, once it gets through you know, the committee that we have enough votes uh, to achieve the Equal Rights Amendment. Senator Collins was unable to be with us tonight, but I uh, wanted to uh, send her well wishes to Campus ERA Day and let's take a listen to that now. Good evening. It is such a pleasure to join you in this important effort to finally ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. In 1776, as the Second Continental Congress was forging a new nation conceived in liberty, Abigail Adams admonished her husband John to remember the ladies. Despite that wise advice, it took nearly a century and a half for women to achieve the right to vote in national elections. Last year, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. It is a tribute to the generations of courageous women and men who fought with unwavering determination for that basic right. I applaud the work that you are doing to finish what they began. It has been nearly 50 years since Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment with overwhelming support from both sides of the aisle. Within just a few years, 35 states had ratified the amendment. If not for the deadlines for ratification, the requirement for 38 states would have been achieved long ago. I'm proud that my state of Maine was among those states that stepped forward in the name of equality. Maine Senator Margaret Chase Smith once addressed the question of what is a woman's proper place. Her famous short answer was, 
everywhere. The rest of her answer describes the importance of the goal we can and must meet. If there is any proper place for women today, it is that of alert and responsible citizens in the fullest sense of the word. Those were Margaret Chase Smith's words. The Equal Rights Amendment aims to ensure that women have the opportunity to succeed everywhere. The time to get it passed is now. Well, our thanks to uh, Senator Collins so much. Well, what brought us so close to recognition of the ERA as the 28th Amendment to the Constitution was the ratification by 38 states, uh, three of which took place in the past few years, as we've noted. Nevada became the 36th state in 2017, Illinois, the 37th state in 2018, and Virginia, the 38th state in 2020. Tonight, we have two state leaders who got us across the finish line of 38, the number of ratifications required uh, for uh, achievement uh, of the ERA. Uh, some would say we're already there, and they can talk a little bit about this. We've got two of the representatives with us. Uh, Steve Anderson led the Republican wing of the coalition that finally uh, crossed the finish line in Illinois in 2018. But Pat Spearman is the woman who started all of this late activity uh, in Nevada and way back, and seems like way back in 2017. Please welcome Nevada State Senator Pat Spearman and former Illinois State Representative Steve Anderson. Pat, do you wanna uh, kick this conversation off? And thank you both so much for being here. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, let me say thanks to my good friend, Steve. Stephen, uh, long time no see, and I thought I had your number, but I don't, so I need to get it from you. So no problem. In touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was listening to the conversation, um, and I think someone asked from Roosevelt House, asked um, what could they do uh, now to kind of help? And I know that there have been questions about whether or not our um, our younger generation um, can really help get this across the finish line. And I was reminded, as uh, Senator Durbin was talking about, um, Barack Obama said um, on one occasion, he said, Dick Durbin told him, he said, sometimes you choose the time and sometimes the time chooses you. And so for those of you who are two generations um, behind when we first started the ERA, uh, the time has chosen you. I think one of the things that we can be very, um, very happy for, and that is um, equality is breaking out everywhere. I mean, it's it's just, it's breaking out everywhere. It's breaking out, you know, not only in the States, but it's, it's, it's just breaking out everywhere. And so I think that is a testament to the people who never gave up, never gave up. Uh, I carried the bill in 2015 and in 2017, but there were people who were just hanging on and some of them bare knuckles hanging on, waiting for the time to choose someone uh, to get there. And I was fortunate enough to be the person that time chose, but I didn't do this by myself. This, this was a team effort, not just on the part of my colleagues in the Senate and in the assembly, but this was a team effort, uh, an intergenerational team effort because there were there were women who were uh, in their 20s uh, that testified. There were women in their 80s that testified um, on behalf of the ERA. So where we are right now, we are, we are almost the manifestation of those who started this a long time ago. And let me just say this, because uh, there are some who, who don't think that this is uh, inclusive of uh, women of color, and I reject that notion. Uh, because as you, you you look around and you see um, people, I mean, I am a woman of color, but but you see Shirley Chisholm and you see so many others who, who have gone unnamed until this time. This is a fight for equality for people, period. This is a fight for equality for people, period. That's what it is. It's wonderful. And thank you for being on with me, Pat. Um, we have been on this uh, these screens from time to time, and I'm always inspired by Senator Spearman's uh, words, and no difference today. 
I, I agree with you, by the way, um, that the idea of, you know, what do we do? How do we do this next? How, and, and it's a learning curve. It has every state you learned as you passed it, you know, the first of the new generation of states. We learned from you. And one, and one of the things that Senator Durbin, my senator, by the way, one of the things he just said to you was get active in political campaigns, be out there. And that is 100% the truth. And that's what's actually going to change things and get us over that 60 vote threshold. And I'm talking about Republicans. Now, I don't know how many folks on this call are Republicans, but I will tell you this, there needs to be positive pressure for the people of my party not negative, not telling them we're going to vote you out of office because it's probably not true. The opposite. We want to work with you. We want to knock doors. If you're there for us on this issue, we'll be there for you on your issues as well. And you can find moderate Republicans uh, throughout the states. It's not just the crazies that we all know and aren't going to mention. We're out there and we're ready to help, but we need your backup. We need your support. And when we talk about, or when I talk about the learning curve, one of the mistakes we made in Illinois had to do with, with women of color. We did not engage them early enough in the process. We almost lost because of that. We almost lost because we had several African-American state representatives, Democrats, pro-choice, who were fighting against it because we had not inculcated them into the process. Now, fortunately, we changed those opinions. But you know what Virginia did? Virginia learned from our mistake. And Virginia went and they incorporated the African-American American folks uh, right at the beginning, the Deltas, right, Senator? The Deltas is the right? It's a sorority, African-American right. sorority, and they brought them to the forefront. And you know what? They delivered. They delivered. So Illinois learned from uh, Nevada, but Virginia learned from Illinois and we keep learning. So the thing I want to urge you all is to keep fighting, but find people you can support, especially on the Republican side, especially there where we need it the most and help them. And then they're gonna to listen to you. So thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Uh, Carol, can I say just one more thing and I promise not to be long-winded. Uh, oh, of course, of course. As we, <laughs> as we, as we move forward towards um, getting the 28th Amendment, Here's what I would encourage everyone to do. Uh, yes, we need tunnel vision to make sure we're fighting for this, but I would encourage you to look on the fringes and see other opportunities to get involved with equality and to get involved with equity, because it is in those fights that you will have the opportunity to talk to people and engage them in this fight. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think I think about uh, the the struggle right now for um, police reform. Uh, there are so many there's so many African American women that I talk to, and the first question they ask me is, "Well, so you're doing all this with the ERA? Where are they when we're talking about you know uh, keeping our sons from getting killed?" So get involved with other activities that that are fighting for equality and equity. Just last uh, last week in the Senate uh, bill that I had, somebody challenged me on Facebook, not Facebook, on Twitter. Somebody challenged me on, on Twitter and said, at Senator Spearman, how come you don't sponsor a bill uh, to uh, to ratify CEDAW? And I accepted the challenge. And so last week we passed a resolution. Uh, it's the Constitution to end discrimination against all women. We passed that and it should be on its way now to, to Congress. So. It's not just this fight, it's the fight for equality. And, and, and let's remember that because, you know, unless everyone is free, no one is free. Unless everyone has justice, there is no justice. Uh, one thing that I, I will never forget, and that is when I was in seminary and learning the meaning of shalom. Uh, shalom is peace, and a lot of people see that, but shalom is also justice. And so you cannot have any peace without justice. This is a fight that we must win. This is a fight that we will win. Thank you so much, Pat and Steve, for your for your words tonight and also for your work uh, throughout the years, bringing us so close uh, to this equality for, for all. 
Uh, well, as uh, you gather from that conversation, the ERA is not just a symbol, a symbolic thing that's happening. It will help us uh, end discrimination on the basis of sex by giving those who suffer discrimination better access to legal recourse. Gender-based violence in our country and in particular campus sexual assault affects millions of women and girls every single year. More and more, thanks to the Me Too movement, uh, women and girls are speaking out and standing up to demand justice. Uh, it is an honor to have Camilla Willingham with us tonight. Camilla is a graduate of Harvard Law School, a survivor of sexual assault, whose case was featured in the film The Hunting Ground. An activist, a feminist, a speaker, and a writer, Camilla's work focuses on campus sexual assault, as well as gender equality and civil rights. We're going to first show you a clip from the wonderful film, the documentary, please see the whole thing. Uh, and then one of our Grove Fellows will have a conversation with Camilla. It was during the winter term of my third year. I knew him really well. We'd met a couple of years earlier. The guy and my girlfriend who was over. We all met at my apartment to have some drinks beforehand and then we went out to this bar. He continued to buy us both more drinks. Half an hour into it, I noticed my girlfriend seemed wasted. <laughs> People started to comment on how drunk my friend seemed. Almost instantly after we got into the taxi, I just felt this extremely heavy feeling come over me. My friend, she was just kind of passed out completely. It was like a maybe 10 minute ride back to my place. Me and my girlfriend kind of just flopped down, like face first on my bed. The next thing I remember, he um, was on top of me and he had a hand inside of my underwear um, and he was trying to put a finger inside of me. I yanked him by the hair and I looked over and I just saw her naked back. Um, and I know that she had fallen asleep with all of her clothes on. And so my next question was, why is she naked? Um, and he, he smiled as he was still on top of me, fondling me with one hand, and he reached out and pet her naked belly and said, oh, I did that, I undressed her. And I asked, you know, and you took off her bra? And um, he, he touched her naked breast while she was still totally unconscious and said, yeah, I did that too. And the next day, he texted me and I said something very casually, like, am I gonna have to tell her that she needs a pregnancy test? And he said in the text message, like, you know, no, we didn't do anything serious. Maybe I put a finger in her V at most. It seemed pretty clear that he had assaulted both of them while they were unconscious. I absolutely presume that Harvard would do right uh, by Camila. I went to the dean of students' office, and she said, I just want to make sure, like, above all else, that you don't talk to anyone about this. It could be bad for everyone if people started rallying around, like, having him removed from campus. And I was like, well, he is, he is a predator, um, and he's dangerous, and actually, that's exactly what I want. We both had the right to legal representation. My lawyer was pro bono. She was a phenomenal client. She really told her story with a great deal of confidence. I went into the hearing and even the professors were like, did I give him the wrong message with our friendship and that he misunderstood our friendship? And the response was like, no, because, you know, <laughs> sex was never part of that friendship. Um, and if we were ever going to be introduced, um, when I was awake would be a good time for that. I'm getting questions like, why didn't you fight him? And he's like, I think like 6'3", over 200 pounds. Um, I was unconscious or just coming to, I like could barely take control of my own body, but why didn't you fight him? 
there was this extreme reluctance to believe me. Campus administrators are overly concerned about false reporting. If you look at statistics on false reporting, it's much, much smaller than what people estimate it to be. The data about false rape claims is that they're a tiny minority of all reports ever made. Rape and sexual assault have the same percentage of false reports that any other crime has in our country. The best research uh, from around the world would put the percentage of false reports somewhere between 2 and 8%. which means 90%, but more likely 95 to 98% of reports are not false. We got done with the hearing probably at 4.30 or 5 o'clock, and they came back very quickly. They had found that he had assaulted me. When we got the call that he was expelled, she was in utter disbelief. That doesn't come very often with these college cases. The next September, I came back to Cambridge and I got a Facebook message from the Dean of Students. She said that the assailant, he could appeal the Ad Board's decision and they voted again on whether to uphold the, the decision to remove him and decided to let him back in. The message is clear. It's don't proceed through these disciplinary hearings. No matter what you do, you're not gonna win. Thank you so much, Ms. Willingham, for being here with us tonight, for sharing your story. I'm so sorry that you had to go through this. And I really wanna ask you, how do you think campus sexual assault cases would be handled differently if there was the Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution? Thanks so much for having me. Um, so first, just as a framing issue, I think it's really important to understand that sexual violence is a form of sex discrimination, and it is also one of the most glaring and persistent manifestations of sex inequality in our society. Um, currently, that documentary came out in 2015. Um, some things have changed since then. Right now, especially with the walking back of our progress under the last administration, um, not much has changed materially for survivors. We know that there are a lot of reasons school administrations fail to protect us. Sometimes it's reputations over conscience. Sometimes it feels like they're basing their responses on a cold calculation of who's more likely to sue them and win in court. Um, because women are not protected in the constitution right now, courts use extreme scrutiny when reviewing sex discrimination claims, which makes it really hard to hold these schools accountable. A lot of people feel like their only choice is to do what I did, um, submitting your story and character to trial by a media and public and take the enormous leap of faith, which is hoping that people will care. And um, often people who take this route end up feeling like they're trading privacy and safety for compounded trauma of exposure or feeling like they're screaming inaudibly into a void. I can't say which is worse, but certainly neither approach, neither approach is justice. Um, so other current options for seeking justice well, relying on the criminal justice system for too many reasons to list here right now often ends the same way, feeling re-traumatized or feeling um, devastatingly invisible. And this isn't even really a safe or viable option for so many survivors, especially the most marginalized among us. Um, observing these kind of dead, em dead ends that we're left with, Congress tried to level the playing field in 1994 with the provision of the Violence Against Women Act, which gave survivors the right to sue our assailants in um, federal civil court. But um, that right was short lived in 2000 when um, a survivor from G Virginia Tech, um, Christy Broncala, tried to sue her assailants, two football players from her school and was categorically shut down by the Supreme Court, which ruled that that provision of VAWA giving us the right to sue our assailants was unconstitutional. And so we were again stripped of another possible avenue for justice. Victims of sexual assault in the school context and in the US at large are systemically unprotected and really have few official avenues for recourse. 
The ERA would change this by empowering legislators on the federal, state, and local level to institute meaningful and lasting protections. It would back up the safety that Title IX once promised with a constitutional guarantee that would ensure that our rights could be um, could not be diminished by future administrations or political trends. So all that is a long way of coming back around to your question. <laughs> um, how would ERA change the way the campus sexual assault cases are handled? Right now, school administrations are basically able to laugh off the threat of legal actions by survivors who are trying to hold them to the promise of an equal education. Um, so having the ERA in the constitution would give us, give schools um, an incentive to take the issue seriously from the resources and thought that they put into prevention efforts to their administrative responses. And of course, all the way to state and federal courts if all else fails. And that means that survivors and our allies could finally demand safe and just learning environments with the confidence that we have backup and firm ground to stand on in the Constitution itself. Thank you so much for that answer. I'd love to also ask you, what do you think we can do as students to create an environment that fosters gender equality and creates greater social change? Yeah, um, great question, especially coming from you, because I think the answer is keep doing exactly what you're doing now. It may not always feel like it, but um, the power of students to create change on their campuses and in society at large really can't be overstated. Um, after the hunting ground came out in 2015, I started visiting college campuses and it was conversations with people like you that gave me hope. I know that hope was well-founded because now I'm looking at all of these stunning changes that have kind of swept through our culture and it was those groups of passionate students that I met with um, and people like them who really drove those changes. For example, you've got um, the collective support of people's gender pronouns and gender neutral terminology. You've got terminology, sorry. And um, just the fact that we can have mainstream conversations about sexual violence and hear these stories on a massive scale with more empathy and understanding and the will to change violent power structures than ever before. I think that if students like you continue to know and stand in your power the way that you have been, we'll be all right. Um, the only thing I would add to that is to just remember to take breaks, <laughs> drink water, take care of yourselves, and also take the time as individuals and as communities to heal. I think that's something we all need to be reminded of, especially for survivors and the, those of us who have faced devastating reminders of our inequality in society. Um, I think it's important to know that um, we deserve healing. The world will continue to be an unjust place and it's just as important to devote our energy to changing that as it is to find the time and space to nurture ourselves, to find ways to be okay, however that looks, to hold on to and celebrate joy um, in spite of injustice. I think that's the other side of this revolutionary work that doesn't get talked about enough, but we can and we must do both. Well, thank you so much, uh, Camilla and Zainab, for a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, once again, we uh, see the need for the uh, ERA, and uh, in real life, uh, it can make a real life difference for all of us. Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, chair of the Oversight uh, Committee, saw the need uh, decades ago and has been a lifelong champion of the ERA in Congress, where she has served since 1992 representing the New York Congressional District that includes Hunter College and Roosevelt House. Uh, now uh, in the House leadership, Chairwoman Maloney has introduced the Equal Rights Amendment in every session of Congress. She's, you know, really, truly uh, one of our champions. I can't, that word is used a lot, but Carolyn Maloney is really one of our true champions. Uh, she has been with us uh, during every campus ERA day. She chaired the so-called shadow hearing that led subsequently to the first mm -hmm. congressional hearing on the ERA in more than 35 years. It is always a privilege to have her with us. And I should note that uh, the ERA coalition honored her last week together with other congressional ERA champions as one of our first Alice Paul awardees. 
and she will tell you herself that she is related uh, to Alice Paul. Um, and she is going to uh, be in conversation with Blaine uh, Yeshagita. And I have been in conversation with Blaine too. You know, she is fabulous. She is a high school student at Washington Liberty High School in Arlington, Virginia. Blaine and Chairwoman Maloney, take it away. Well, uh, you want to go first, Blaine? Or... Oh, got it. <laughs> okay. First of all, I, I, I want to tell you how much I've enjoyed this. I, I've learned a great deal and been inspired even more by the energy and thoughtfulness and leadership of the young people in this program, the GROW program. And I want to thank the Hunter College for having it in the first place and investing in young women's education and with this program. And I want to challenge them to send you to Washington for a week and have you really volunteer, voluntarily uh, lobby, go around and talk to the senators and Congress members and try, well, really the senators is what we have to focus on, see if you can make the difference in changing their minds. It would be a, a great way for you to learn um, the way you can make things happen in Congress. I, I wanna start by thanking the ERA Coalition for all of your invaluable work. Uh, Jessica and Carol, you have really, uh, surpassed my expectations. Uh, a lot of the success that we've had recently is absolutely due to your coordinating uh, and, and um, work in your leadership and being there. Um, I, as, he, as Carol said, I, I introduced the ERA practically every year I was here. I never saw it moving anywhere. And so I decided that the problem was, even though everybody said, of course, uh, I agree with it and I wanna support it, people weren't willing to really, or they couldn't because they had other jobs, give it the focus that it needed. Uh, so I, I reached out to Jessica and Carol to form an organization whose sole and only purpose was to advance the Equal Rights Amendment because it is so right and so needed as uh, Camilla pointed out with her very painful uh, story that women are not protected from, from sexual violence. You have no recourse. And, uh, and uh, Jessica and Carol asked him to form an organization that just focused on the ERA. And when people ask what happened in the last 40 years, I'd say a big part of it was the leadership of, of really uh, the ERA coalition and, and all the new leadership and the new president and other people that have come in to be part of it, including the young people today. And, when many of us would have liked to have been in Nevada with Pat Spearman or in Illinois with Senator Stevenson or in Virginia, uh, we had a, another job. I was voting on the floor and, and other people were uh, doing their work. And Steinem was writing a book probably and Heidi was uh, doing another play. Other people had other responsibilities, but the ERA coalition was there from beginning to end, uh, plotting, putting the pieces together to make it happen. And I, I wanna thank them. I, I also wanna thank all the participants today. I learned so much from my colleagues in government, but really Camilla, I found your story uh, so painful uh, to listen to, but it really points out one of the principal ways that the ERA is so important and fundamental. Women are not protected from sexual violence. People know they can get away with it and they do because we're not in the constitution. And Camilla mentioned the uh, very famous Broncala decision uh, where she faced the same treatment. Uh, she was raped by two college uh, football stars, but in front of a lot of people, there was no question in anyone's mind, she was raped. One of her assailants actually confessed, yes, I raped her. Yet she appealed to the the school, they did nothing, uh, the, the state, they did nothing, the city, they did nothing. She ended up in the Supreme Court and it would, they never even looked at the body of what was there, uh, their, their decision, they threw it out on a technicality, basically, uh, from the saying she didn't have the right to sue, she didn't have standing, women aren't in the constitution and uh, you needed the commerce clause to have standing. What do you mean? The woman was violated, she was raped, it is serious, serious crime, and yet they threw it out. So I think that is a fundamental reason to protect women from sexual assault. It gives the women the right to sue 
and you nothing will turn it around more uh, than getting women in the Constitution. And, and secondly, if we're not in the Constitution, then we can't enforce the laws that we pass against discrimination. As Carol has said, yeah, we, we, we need to uh, be able to protect ourselves from discrimination because of our sex. But as Scalia very famously said that we're not in the constitution and, and we're not protected. And the only issue is whether it prohibits it, it doesn't. Nobody ever thought that that's what it meant. So no one, nobody ever voted for it. So that ERA, getting it in the constitution would definitely make uh, discrimination against women wrong. And we will never enforce equal pay for equal work until we get it into the constitution. So it's really, worth fighting for. And I'm so thrilled to see these new warriors uh, here that you're working with. And uh, uh, failure is impossible. Elizabeth, uh, Susan B. Anthony told us that story, failure is impossible. But should we face failure, which is always possible, let's be honest, then seeing your faces, uh, knowing that you'll be there. Believe me, there is nothing more important you could do than to get women into the Constitution. I spent half my time in Congress fighting to hold on to rights that we already have because they keep coming trying to take it away from us, whether it's abortion rights or uh, Title IX, equality of treatment in sports. I, any way they keep trying to take it away and we have to fight it. Yet if it was in the Constitution, it would be rock solid. Uh, we could go on to other things. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. I was at the hearings with Kavanaugh and I was so upset that this guy was going to the Supreme Court and we were battling it, we weren't getting anywhere and we knew we didn't have the votes. And it finally occurred on me that that was the wrong battle. What we needed to fight for was the document by law, he is limited in what he can do based on that document. Once you get women's rights into that constitution, it doesn't matter who is, uh, you know, who is uh, on the Supreme Court or the president or, or the head of the speaker, we depend on their leadership to protect us. But if we were in the constitution, the constitution itself protects us and he could not make these determinations that we are afraid that he may make because of his prior decisions before the court. Thank you, Chairwoman. I think Blaine has some questions for okay. you. <laughs> Go right ahead, Blaine. Of course. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Congresswoman Maloney, you answered many of my first couple questions, but um, as you know, I work with Judge Ratify, which is a youth-led organization to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. We do a lot of uh, advocacy, and something that we are always wondering is what are some of the, you know, main pieces of advice that uh, for our predecessors and current leaders of the movement uh, have for us? So, that being said, for the young people here today, uh, do you have any advice for them as to what work as the um, as they work for the movement and prepare to carry on the torch for the ERA? On how to carry on the torch? Well, I think a lot of what you're doing right now, I think it's a phenomenal achievement that you have 50, 52 uh, uh, universities involved. That's great, and uh, and also major leaders in the Senate that uh, we need their help to go forward, um, getting. Um, Susan Collins is an extreme uh, game changer in my opinion. Uh, I worked for, believe it or not, 20 years on a bill that I found uh, non-controversial. I was looking for ways to build steps across the aisle. And uh, we put in this bill to put a women's museum on the mall. 20 years later, I couldn't pass it. Not that I didn't work on it all the time, but we finally got it through largely due to the leadership of Susan Collins. Uh, so first of all, I would reach out and thank her. And I would go to her and ask for advice because uh, we're not gonna pass it unless we have Republicans on our side, we need it. Now, if you pass something without the involvement of the other party, uh, in our body, we always are up and down like a seesaw. The Democrats are in charge, the Republicans are in charge. But if you ever pass one without the other party, the first thing they do when they get in power, they just throw it out. If you notice, uh, uh, Biden is throwing out every single executive order that President Trump threw at us and did in, our, my, in many of our opinions illegally. He's throwing them all out. Uh, but if you do it in a bipartisan way, then it is permanent set law. And, uh, 
And to me, it's hard for me to understand why they are not for it. For me, equal rights for everyone is like having a glass of a water. It's an accepted right. It should be there. I don't even understand any argument they should have against it. We should be out there, out front, uh, making the case even more. We should make more noise, I think, about- And, and, chair, and chairwoman, we will. Blaine, we owe you a rematch with the chairwoman. I love the look of this conversation. Uh, our time, however, uh, is, uh, is running out. Chairwoman, thank you so much. Blaine, thank you for the work that you do at Generation Ratify. They, Chairwoman, you should know they are so good. They take notes on our work and they send it back to us and they say, it's not intersectional enough, try again, you know? So I wanna thank Blaine and Generation I just wanna Ratify. end with this, a message to the young women. <laughs> they, there they, is they, no way we can lose. Right. Because the challenges that our founding mothers had were far more severe. <laughs> Alice right. Paul was put in an insane asylum, force fed because she said women should have the right to vote. So right. we don't even know what obstacles are. Right, we're gonna get it, we're getting it done. We're de getting it done. And I understand that there is a student who wants to ask the final question from Indianapolis. Uh, Chelsea, are you there? Indiana, okay. Uh, Chelsea, ah, you're there. Thank you so much. You're, you have the final question. <laughs> Great. It's so great to have all these speakers. It's been amazing to be a part of all of this. I'm here representing um, Purdue University and Indiana as a state. Um, and I just want to say that I'm here to say to Senators Todd Young and Mike Braun, my senators for Indiana, that we want you to support the Equal Rights Amendment, be on the right side of history, support Indiana Hoosiers by supporting the ERA. Um, I don't have a specific question for you all, just a lending support from the state of Indiana. Thank you so much. Well, Chelsea, we thank you for that. What a great way to close out, you know, for everyone uh, participating and watching uh, to reach out to your senators to for uh, the support of SJ uh, Res 1, removal of the time limit on the ERA, and for every other way forward, as Senator Durbin expressed the, you know, the several options uh, to us. I want to thank everybody uh, for being a part of the fifth annual Campus ERA Day. We are planning on making this the last because we're getting the ERA this year. Uh, we're so proud of this event and truly believe that together we can finally get the ERA recognized as the 28th Amendment to the Constitution. And right the wrong that was done to women when the Constitution was first written. You are the key to our success. All of you out there, we need your voices. We need your energy. And we are going to end with the fabulous band Betty, uh, another Campus ERA Day veteran musical force. They've been with us every year. Uh, they've been campaigning with us for the ERA and done this brilliant song and video, Rise. Uh, it's been a great evening. We thank you so much. We look forward to rising up with you all with the 28th Amendment to the Constitution, the Equal Rights Amendment. Thank you for being with us. Up, get up, dance up, get up, sing up, get up, change everything. Up, get up, dance up, get up, sing up, get up, change everything. Silence must stop, violence must end. Broken body and spirit will rise again. Strength in numbers, take a stand. Right the wrongs, don't ask a man. If one woman hurts, if one woman cries, if one man bleeds, rise, rise. Up, get up, dance up, get up, sing up, get up, change. Taking our place.